put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. Iron Man 3 movie thoughts. So obviously, I gotta talk about Ben Kingsley as the actor. <laughs> I, I, I loved it. I at first I was like, what the what what just happened when when he is sounded like, oh, did you know that fortune cookies aren't actually Chinese? They're like they're American made after Japanese recipe and then you know Tony's like so so you're like the double or something. What you mean like the understudy? No no, I'm him and oh, they they won't let me have a real gum and this whole He's hilarious. He's just so... Ben Kingsley must have had the time of his life playing this doped up, quirky, weird little British actor. And I love how that actually ties into, you know, the, I'm about to shoot with the master and he you know how he gets, you know, and they're all like very serious, very careful, you know, the master is about to shoot, and he comes in and sits down, and at the time you're thinking like he's gonna kill them all if he doesn't get his way, but no, in reality, the dude's an actress, an actor, I swear that was not a Freudian slip, it's, it's the beard, it just, it just, it reminds me of an ant, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the, just the way, he, the, the, the soccer match with ah, go, ole, 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 and, and Rose's like, I'm gonna shoot you in the face, it just, it's, it's fantastic. And, and with that, I do, of course, have to mention the, the kiss, kiss, bang, bang-ish banter between Robert Downer Jr. and then the guy who knows how to use a weapon, you know, it's, it's just phenomenal with, you know, he shoots and, you know, ducks down. Oh yeah, you sure killed that glass. Well, nobody could hit the bulb at that distance and, you know, Rody gets up one shot and he gets the bulb, you know, and it's like, okay, just hold my spot, you know, and, and he, what did you see? Nothing, it was too fast. I'm, I'm gonna go again, you know, it's just the whole thing. And, and I already mentioned the review, I, the climax is fantastic. I mean, we have... Rhodey, who has, you know, both Rhodey and Antonio are there, and Rhodey obviously has a, a bit of a stake in this, you know, it was because he was lured to, you know, they, they got the suit from him, he feels responsible, he was supposed to protect the precedent, and now because of him, the precedent is trapped, so that's, yeah, they, they, you know, they used the... Iron Patriot armor as a, you know, Trojan horse. Also, briefly, just gotta mention, I love the bit where Tony has to get the, the username and the password, and he's like, the password is War Machine Rocks, Rocks from the Next, all caps, and, and you see these, you know, the, these, these uh, Middle Eastern people, like, <laughs> laughing, and then he doesn't, he doesn't turn around and face them, but he turns the gun around to face them, and then they just stop. It's just, it, yeah, that was, that was pretty badass, you know, just, don't laugh. You know, and, and Tony's like, laughing, and just, what? That is so much cooler than the Iron Patriot. And, yeah, yeah, just, so, so, Rhodey's got a pretty big stake in it. Tony's there, but, you know, without the armor, and, well, you know, they've got a handgun each, and, you know, you've got the president there in the Iron Patriot armor and he's suspended over this, this oil so they're going to torch him with the Roxxon oil. You've got all these people there, you know, it's the biggest collection of extremist soldiers 
yet. You know, so far you've seen two of them in one place at a time at the most. You know, and that was enough to give Tony serious trouble. And now there's like what, six of them, maybe twelve total. And you know, you've got Killian there, who we already know has got the, the experiments thing down, and just the whole thing. And Tony calls in a ton of these, I guess, copies of the Mark Ford too, because they seem to be able to do the the joint, you know, thing. I love how one of them flies towards two of these extremist soldiers, and they try try to do the the three thousand degrees Celsius thing on it, and it and they're like on its arms or something, and it detaches the hands, and flies them behind them and uses them to punch them off, something like that. That was fantastic. They really put those to great use. The bit where he's in the water and the hand comes off and grabs, it, grabs his hand like a glove and pulls him out of the water, and he's like almost drowning. Great use of the, the perspective. It's, it's again similar to, you know, the early parts of Iron Man 1 where we never actually see his attackers when he's, you know, taken at the very beginning. We just see what he sees, you know, so we see the jeep in front explode and, you know, the, the, the soldiers get shot, but we don't, we never see anyone shooting in, in that sequence. And so, yeah, we have the, the helmet filling up with water and the whole thing. I also love that he saves Pepper using the armor before he saves himself, and then she saves him. I got you. I got you first. And and the giant rabbit is of course a lot of fun. And the the <laughs> the bit where Maya and Pepper meet and it's like, oh, it's an ex-girlfriend. No, no, it was just one night. Oh, well, that's how you used to do that sort of. Thing. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, it's sort of reminiscent of the take out the trash bit from the first movie, only with, you know, now Pepper has a bit more of a stake in it because now they actually are together, you know. I'm going to get back to the climax in just a, a few seconds. I love how they very directly set up the conflict between, you know, the, the three-way, you know, the love triangle between Pepper, Tony, and Tony's tech, where the Mark 42 literally grabs her, uh, grabs her wrist as she's about to, like, you know, get him to wake up, because she can tell he's having a nightmare, and, like, the Mark 42 reads that as her trying to attack him or something like that, because clearly, clearly he's in distress, and he's like, you know, oh, they shouldn't have been able to work while I was asleep, and then he's like, I can, I can fix this, you know, let me do my tech thing and I can fix this, but, you know, th the problem already is, the problem is there because of him fiddling with the tech so much, so that's, that was quite good, the way they, they do that. Now, the, let's see, about the climax, I do feel that it was maybe almost too much that Killian actually came back from being blown up inside Mark 42, but yeah, that was, that was, excuse me, almost like Terminator-ish. I, excuse me, maybe that's just me, but actually when he comes out of the fire and he's like, oh, burn, I literally thought Terminator, and maybe the music went there a little bit as well, I don't know. And they had already done the, the, the Robocop thing with the, you know, the sharp spike thing chopping off the arm. And of course, Pepper is there again, and and for a few seconds there, you literally think that she's gonna attack Tony, you know. And it's just, what are you doing with the, you know? And and he's like, no, Jarvis, stand down. I, I know I said to, you know, attack you know, extremist targets with extreme prejudice, but not her, and and the whole thing. And then she ends up doing to uh, to, to Killian to to kill him what Tony did earlier with the suit. You know, he, well, he can't shoot. Well, okay, he's gonna throw the thing and then shoot it with the, the blast thing. I also loved how she couldn't quite figure out the suit when she was trying to rescue Maya. And so she, she tries to shoot and it's not gonna work. And she lowers her hand and then it shoots, you know, 
backwards and hurls them through the window. That was pretty funny. Tony's homemade weaponry for when he doesn't have the Iron Man suit, when it's not fully charged yet, and he breaks in using these, you know, he throws this little Christmas ball thing that you hang on a Christmas tree, and it's like a bomb, and he's got this glove, that, you know, the, the power glove of, of, you know, electricity. That is one heck of a joy buzzer, is what I'm saying. You know, he's got this, these couple of guns, of shit, and, and he just buys all this stuff in, in this local little place, you know, that they're in Tennessee. <laughs> and a little thing, why did you fly me to Tennessee? I have to go back and say Pepper. Oh, but this is exactly where you told me to be. Actually, I might be a little off right now. Another Monty Python reference here. I, I seem fine, sir, but then sometimes at the, at the end of the sentence, I come out with the wrong cranberry. How Paul Bettany was able to say that and not crack up, I have no clue. Yeah, now the, the, when, when the cold blood, I think that's like the, the comic book name. It's never actually said in the movie, but I don't remember the actual character name, but the guy, you know, the, the henchman who's also inside the Iron Patriot suit, you know, when the president says to him, you know, just kill me now, that's not how the Mandarin works. He could have literally just said, that's not how a movie villain works. Dude, you're supposed to be, I'm sure you can be saved for the end, you know. But it was really clever flying him, flying the president away in the Iron Patriot suit. So no one thinks to stop that because they're like, well, that's Rhodey, isn't it? Yeah, that was, that was really, really clever. And they can, you know, of course, control it. So, yeah, fantastic. And then the... You know, once Tony shows up, Cold Blood makes sure to blow up the thing so that these 13 people are, you know, falling down. And he has to fly after them. And also the thing with him shooting for the, the stomach thing, you know, what was it? Walk away from that, this jerk, or something like that. You know, some PG-13, you know, insult, obviously. But, but yeah, it, it was a fairly clever plan with the, the present hanging there over the rocks on oil. So it seems like a Mandarin sort of thing to do. And really, it's just so that it can look like the Mandarin. And, you know, they've, of course, got the vice president, which, really, I mean, it's Miguel Ferrer. When isn't he a villain? I, just, the, the dude, the, the face, yeah, it's just, yeah. And you know, he's of course got the door. Nice, quick establishing of of what you know his motivation is. And and you know, and the Mandarin wasn't lying. He just said, "Well, the plan involves the vice president." So it's, you know, he just didn't he didn't tell them how because he probably didn't. You know, he's not all there. So yeah, he was in on it. Was how he was involved. And uh, yeah, it makes sense, you know, president dead, president's dead, vice president in charge, he gets extremis, and Aldrich can keep running the show from the shadows, and now he has the president of the Ameri of the, of the United States on his side, you know. And so, like he said, he has both the greatest terrorist and, you know, the yeah, the, the forces that fight the war on terror. And he has that line about you know, controlling the supply and demand of the war on terror. Now, I'm not certain, I completely understand, but I guess what it boils down to is, it's a ton of power and influence, because really, if he wants a law passed, and there's some trouble with it, you know, he's gonna try to have it passed through the president, Miguel, he's just gonna have, you know, he's gonna arrange an attack, let the Mandarin take credit, and thus get this new law through, you know, with, with this sort of threat. So that, that makes pretty good sense, pretty good sense. Now, I, 
I did think that the fire breathing thing almost pushed it too far, almost got like silly, but <laughs> they played it right. I mean, you know, he does it and then Rhodey's like, okay, you can breathe fire, you know, because of course he's gonna come out fighting, you know, that's like, you know, so he, you know, gets a single punch in or something with, with cold blood and yeah. Now, I am... While I overall like that it kind of came out of nowhere, I do wonder how exactly Tony had all those extra suits for the climax. I mean, I guess he wasn't keeping those at the you know mansion that got blown up, but you know, also real smart of him to stay there after giving up the address. But yeah, that's that's Tony's dark. He just and obviously Pepper is trying to get out of there as fast as she can. And then they start arguing about the big bunny. As you do. Now the... Yeah. The bit with the... Crap, I lost my train of Right, the, the... Yeah, he must not have had all those suits in the home. But then again... <laughs> I mean, as for him hiding them somehow, somewhere, in these films, in this trilogy, nobody watches Inventors until it's too late, until they suddenly have an incredibly deadly weapon on their hands. So I guess he gets a pass. Now, I was a... a little... The, 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 the issue of anonymity of, of Aldrich, where he's talking about how up on the roof there, he was, you know, he considered that he could just kill himself, but he also realized, he suddenly realized that when he was anonymous, he could do more, he could rule from the shadows, and then later he came up with the Mandarin, because the danger needed a face, and that kind of thing. Now... I feel like they're trying to say that he was behind it all along, ha ha ha, but what exactly was he behind? Okay, so maybe he was behind the terrorists in the first movie. I can actually totally see that with the whole Ten Rings connection, but that kind of, I mean, they weren't doing that much. They were, they were Middle Eastern terrorists, they had gotten some stark weaponry, which in fact was really Obadiah Stain doing that, and you know, by the end of the first movie, they seem to be gone. So, it, it just seems like, I think they were trying to do this, the big trilogy thing where the bad guy in the third movie is responsible for certainly at least what happened in the first, and maybe in the second as well. And it just doesn't really feel like it completely works in this one. I mean, I'm not saying that the terrorists of the first movie were, you know, completely nothing. I'm just saying they weren't... I don't know, they... they yeah, they, they weren't as big a threat as, you know, as could be, it is, yeah, yeah, I just don't feel like he, he was really, I, I feel like we missed some specifics on what exactly he caused, what he did that he was doing from the shadows. I don't mind the idea, and in fact, I find the, the supply and demand of oh, the Warranter quite clever. I have not seen that very many other stories, and it makes sense because if you just take one stance, if you just fight for one side, then there's always going to be opposition. But if you control both sides in a conflict, then you are always going to win as long as no one figures out that you're controlling both sides. And that's quite clever. And what it seems like he was moving towards, and again, I. I don't feel like we got that many details, so if I completely misunderstood this, feel free to correct me. 
once Miguel was the president, he would, you know, help Aldrich get extremists into U.S. soldiers, into like, you know, making it a thing, you know. You know, he already had this, you know, little batch of former, you know, military people who had lost at least one limb each and with extremists got them back and then vowed to, yeah, continue helping. And, yeah, I, I you know, so, so he could make some money through that and, yeah, you, you were going to have this thing of, you know, Common to the I mean, trilogy of the the guy who wants to be the biggest gun owner to to sell something that will really change the way war is fought, so that he can make a tremendous amount of money out of it. You know, it's contrasting that with who Tony Stark is now. You know, it's it's having Tony face his past. You you could say the the arrogant, irresponsible past where he really didn't care if people got hurt, basically, or he, he at least didn't make sure that they didn't. Now, I am not entirely sure if... A, a quick, just, stray thought is that yeah, it, it was quite fortunate for Tony that there was footage of the original test on, of, of extremists that, you know, included the, that one, you know, exploding it. I guess they just happened to have a camera far enough away and, in fact, somebody was nice enough to cut the whole thing together and just leave it there just in case somebody needed to find some incriminating evidence, you know. And by the way, I loved the, the, the fan, the, the Tony's biggest fan, that, you know, right now, Tony needs Gary. And Gary needs Tony, yes. Just, yeah. The, the whole thing is just, uh, okay, is, is this just your van or is anybody else coming by? Because he's like, I said, dude, I, I thought I'd have some privacy here. Is anybody coming by other than you or... Can we, can we just talk like two people here now? Now, the, the, yes, the plan. As far as I could tell, the idea of the, the extremists making people blow up was not part of the plan. You know, that was, that was one of the problems with it that, you know, Maya brought up way back when he met her in 1999. And they just hadn't managed to solve that yet, as far as I could tell. So sometimes it would go wrong. Like when, when Cold Blood gives drugs to that one guy, I don't think he's supposed to blow up, but then it happens and, yeah, and, and Mandarin gets the blame or takes the responsibility so that there's, you know, they, they it, it seems to me like Killian needed some explanation for the explosion so that it wouldn't be, well, extremis isn't perfectly safe yet. You know, he didn't want that. It, you know, it would stop the, the research, you know. And AIM is all about the profit and the, the violent revolutions. It, they actually seem to not have changed that much from the comics. That was kind of cool. Anyway, the... Yeah, so, so, the explosions were unintended, and every time they happened, the Mandarin took the blame, which seems to suggest that also the Mandarin came about when these explosions, you know, when they started happening with human beings, when they went to clinical trials. And so, you know, hence why also the, the one in Tennessee, yeah, that one was like, Tony discovered that it was actually the Mandarin, or that extremist, but he, he didn't, you know, it hadn't been reported as one or something like that, so I guess maybe Killian hadn't thought up the Mandarin for that first one or something, maybe that one was where he discovered 
that it could have like something. Although that seemed to be like with the woman in the footage that Tony saw. But anyway, I can basically deal with that. But then it does not really seem like he's trying to, that that he cares that much about fixing it because he kills Maya when when she threatens you know and then after she's dead nothing is ever mentioned of the fact that extremists can make you blow up if not like done right like had they gotten so much better that it just didn't happen as often I just I almost feel like the it, it also kind of as another element before I present my conclusion on it it seems to me like most of what the Mandarin did was just take credit for these explosions. The one other thing that I can really remember that he did was this, the, the killing of the leader of Roxxon. You know, to, to show the president, you can't stop this. You know, I'm, I'm telling you what you can do and when you do it, I'm not gonna stop, I'm still gonna kill him, so there's nothing you can do. Y you know, other than that, well, we saw him, you know, lighting a corpse on fire and shooting stuff, you know, that seemed to just be like hammering home, you know, that seemed like it was extra for when he took credit for a bombing, so really, what was the Mandarin doing and what was Killian going to have the Mandarin do if all that had really happened so far were these unintended explosions. Again, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it just seems like I think it was maybe one twist too many at some point. But but yeah, the and with Maya, with how little she is in the movie and how little she does in the movie, I almost feel like it could have been just, you know, that Killian somehow found the, you know, that he stumbled onto it himself in connection with that thing on the roof or something, you know, I, I don't know. The, basically, to sum up, Maya tries to get Tony's help with the, you know, when he, when she goes there at the, at the apartment. And I guess she, yeah, she hadn't told, uh, you know, Killian that she would be doing this, hence why he almost blew her up. And, uh, which, I'm not really saying that that doesn't make sense. I could see that she, I could imagine that she wouldn't tell him, and that she wouldn't have been told about the attack. Or maybe she just threw caution to the wind. Anyway, I'm, I'm not saying that that's really a problem. Now, after that, she, you know, Pepper takes her away into some hotel room, and from that, Killian is able to find and get Pepper. And that's when we find out that Maya was okay with Killian doing the extremist stuff. And then Maya has Tony in the dungeon, and he appeals to her, like, her lost innocence, I guess, and she, you know, she is won over and she threatens to kill herself if they, I don't even remember exactly what she said, if, if they, yeah, anyway, so yeah, and Killian goes ahead and kills her, and no mention is then made of the fact that apparently they still don't know how to keep people from blowing up, you know. It's, it's the problem that is as old as time itself. How does how to keep people from blowing up? And yeah, I'm I'm just not sure. I feel that she contributed all that much for yeah. I, I don't know. I I also didn't really feel that it added too much with. Tony having sort of figured out something about the extremist virus that he wrote on the back of that card and 
then he's supposed to like help them out, but he won't because, you know, he, yeah, he doesn't want to do that, so. It didn't really seem to go anywhere. Again, I feel like they should have maybe had there actually be problems with, you know, extremists making people blow up after Maya died, and maybe Tony was somehow able to do something about it, and he uses that knowledge to trick Killian or something. Yeah. Now, I think that might be pretty much it. Now. Yes, I suppose that pretty well covers it. I, I just got to talk very briefly about the post credit sequence. I just love that it's just them having fun. It's, it's not at all like a hint of the next movie or any kind of thing. No, it's just, you know, yep, here's your post credit sequence. And sure, here's a cameo from one of the you know, people that... And, and it's not any kind of setup for a future film or anything, and it's just hilarious. I love that he missed the entire story. So it's something about an elevator in Bern. So he missed the whole thing. You know, really, it, it all starts in 1983. I was 14 years old, and I still had a nanny. That's weird. And, and Banner's just like, oh make it stop, and yeah, yeah, that was just... <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I love this movie. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.